here are the ruins of a Greek amphitheater. And uh, had you lived at the time of classical Greece, you would have seen some of the greatest plays in human history uh, performed uh, in that uh, space. Plays written by such tremendous artists as Aeschylus, shown on the left, and Sophocles uh, on the right. Uh, Aeschylus is thought of as being sort of the father of Greek tragedy. But what is on his grave, what's, what's inscribed on his grave, has nothing to do with his achievements as a playwright or as an artist. What's on his gravestone is that here was a man who fought at Marathon. He was a soldier. And Sophocles, another great playwright, was at one point a strategos, which is a, a, a ancient Greek term, meaning approximately general. So these were great playwrights, but they were also familiar with military uh, affairs. And if you were to go back to that amphitheater and populate it with an audience, many of the men in the audience would have been military veterans. And many of the women would have been the spouses of those veterans and would have known all too well um, the scars, both physical and emotional, that those men brought back with them from combat. Now, a few years ago, a, uh, a British, um, British director came up with the idea that certain Greek tragedies, certain Greek plays were not just about veterans, but written for veterans, written for those uh, veterans in the amphitheater as a, as a way to reach out to them, as a way to convey that we understand, we playwrights understand what you have undergone and what goes on inside of your, your heart. Here he is um, explaining uh, an idea that he had and brought to fruition, um, uh, an idea of, uh, I think, extraordinary uh, perceptive, perceptiveness and imagination. Let's take a listen. What can ancient Greek tragedies written nearly 2,500 years ago by a general officer and playwright named Sophocles say to us now that can help us face some of the most morally complex issues of our time? There is a theory that storytelling, the most ancient technology of them all, was born from the need to hear and tell the soldier's story, to help veterans make meaning out of their fragmented memories and to speak the unspeakable. Picture 17,000 citizen soldiers sitting in an outdoor amphitheater in the center of the city of Athens in a theater of Dionysus. They are seated according to tribe, which is their military unit, and according to rank with the general officers seated in the front row and the hoplite cadet seated in the nosebleed section in the back. They have come together to hear plays that only those who've been to war or cared for those who've been to war could possibly understand. They have come together in a century in which Athens has seen 80 years of war to mourn their dead, to wail, to weep, to laugh, and to listen, and to bear witness as a community to the truth of the experience of war. Now picture a thousand war-weary U.S soldiers sitting in a movie theater or a drill hall or a field house. They have, as been, as been said in the military, been voluntold to attend a mandatory performance of a play about a fierce and respected warrior who 
slips into a depression after losing one of his best friends, tries to attempt to murder his commanding officers, fails, and then against the pleading and wishes of his wife and his family and troops, ultimately takes his own life. It could be a story ripped from today's headlines, as I know we all know, but it is the story of Sophocles' Ajax. The first person to stand up after one of our performances for a military audience said the following, Hello, I am the proud mother of a Marine and the wife of a Navy SEAL, and my husband went away four times to war, and each time he came back just like Ajax, dragging invisible bodies into our house. And to quote from the play, our home is a slaughterhouse. A tech mesa. Ajax's wife in the play has this line as she hesitates to tell the chorus what has become of their brave leader. She says, how can I say something that has never been spoken? Sophocles ple plays help us now and then to answer that essential question. When people see their own struggles and lives reflected in an ancient narrative, they open up and they say things they never expected to say out loud, let alone in front of an audience, personal, deep things about their experiences. After an early performance of theater of war, a Vietnam veteran came up to me and said, knowing that PTSD is from BC makes me feel less alone in the world. After another performance at a, a military base, a soldier came up to me and said, Brian, I've been separated from my unit for four years. Being separated from your unit is like being stripped of your humanity. I think Sophocles wrote these plays to restore humanity to individuals for who, whatever reason, felt they had lost their humanity along the way. I think he wrote these plays to help us heal. Without humanity, none of this means anything. And perhaps most memorably, a general officer stood up after one of our performances and said the following, I think Sophocles might have been in the minority with regard to his compassion for the individuals who were struggling with the issues in his community that he portrayed in his plays. I think Sophocles was trying to send a letter leadership message out to the highest ranking and lowest mem ranking members of his community. I think Sophocles wrote these plays and had them staged in the center of his city to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And that is what happens every time we present Theater of War, now 175 times for more than 40,000 service members, veterans, and their families all over the world. And all of our other projects that now address pressing public health and social justice issues through live theater, community dialogue, and a range of other media, including graphic novels, web comics, and other social media, People are comforted by what brings them together across time as human beings and across very divergent standpoints, and they are afflicted by the understanding that empathy isn't always enough and by the moral responsibility to do everything they can to mitigate the suffering of individuals living in their communities. Theater is an ancient military technology which we are now licensing from Sophocles to raise awareness, to erode stigmas, to promote understanding and healing and, yes, resilience, and to stir our fellow citizens to action. Thank you very much. I saw one of these performances uh, when I was at the U.S. Army War College. I was a visiting professor there for two years between 2008 and 2010. It was held in Bliss Hall, which is the largest uh, auditorium um, that the War, Army War College had. And, and, and although nobody was voluntold to go and watch this performance, uh, the auditorium was full. And it was full of the officers and it was full of the officers' wives and chaplains and psychologists and everyone who was concerned about these officers, most of whom had just returned from tours of duty in Iraq and one tour of duty in particular during the surge um, in 2007, uh, which succeeded in setting the conditions 
the military conditions for political settlement in Iraq had never really happened. But while it was going on, it was very bloody and very difficult. And the people who came back from, from that, um, we were told, was, as faculty, we were told that one third of them at least would have the, the preliminary um, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we were taught how to identify that and then how to approach these officers um, to encourage them to get help, uh, either sort of over on top of the radar by going to see psychologists and so forth, or under the radar by talking in confidence with chaplains who are very well trained at dealing with this. And one of the things in which I take pride is that as someone with bipolar disorder, I've chosen to be public um, about it for, for many years. And I think taken on the whole, uh, it's done good. It's, you know, I've done, uh, it's been a good thing. But it was particularly a good thing at the Army War College. Uh, and, and people there respected my candor about having bipolar disorder in a way that frankly, people in academe don't. They know that they're supposed to respect it. They know that they that there are certain phrases that they're supposed to use and not use and this kind of a thing. I don't know that they have any passion for it. They don't really care about it. But the officers did, and the faculty did in particular. And one of the things that I was told happened more than once was when an officer was reluctant to get any help. You know, wanted to continue to pretend that he was bulletproof. You know, Someone would, would point, there's Professor Grimsley over there. He's got bipolar disorder. He's got the guts to talk about. It. He's got the guts to manage it. Why don't you find some guts? And the two things are different. Bipolar disorder is a biochemical disorder. It's a mental illness. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder or battle stress injury, which is its precursor that's, it's, that is an injury, it's not a, it's not a disorder. But they have two things in common. They both have a stigma attached to them and they both have to be managed. And you have to have the courage to face the, the stigma that may come your way. And you have to have the courage to seek help. And that's what the war in his fullness does. The war in his fullness is not afraid to seek help. The warrior in his fullness knows that he's not bulletproof and doesn't need to be bulletproof. So um, what my memories of the performance I saw at the theater war at the Army War College are mingled with my own personal experience of interacting with officers and helping them deal with the horrible things that, uh, that they saw, that anyone sees um, in a war zone. This is a photograph taken in uh, New Orleans. And what you see there is Gunnery Sergeant Michael A. Bennett, an equal opportunity advisor for 4th Marine Aircraft Wing Headquarters, sharing his experiences with suicide prevention after theater of wars reading of Ajax at Marine Corps Support Facility, New Orleans. That was in September, 2016. The purpose of theater of war, again, is to engage military audiences in a discussion of behavioral health and suicide prevention through a dramatic reading of Sophocles' classic play, Ajax. And this, this play, the Sophocles, Sophocles play, Ajax, can be performed in different kinds of ways. So here we have um, a play well received, the, the, uh, done by a female uh, playwright, as a matter of fact, and, and some of the most prominent characters in it um, are female, including Ajax, who is played in this, in, in this uh, who is played here by um, a woman. So you have uh, Sophocles' Ajax being enacted in this, uh, in this context. And uh, 
Um, finally, what I want to leave you with is a video in which you can see what one of these performances looks like. And before I do that, what I want to suggest to you, what I want to remind you of is that the study of war is far more expansive than one might think when you walk into a history of war course for the first time. That you might think that talking of Carl Jung and the warrior ethos and the code of the warrior, this kind of thing, you know, doesn't really connect in with military history. And that the discussion of Achilles and Hector in the Iliad, while perhaps interesting, what relationship does that bear to military history? Well, it is quite possible, even probable, that when Homer composed the Iliad, he was doing the same kind of thing that Sophocles was doing. He was attempting to convey to his society the costs, the personal and emotional toll that war takes upon the warriors who must fight them. Cut my throat right here, right now. Add me to this pile. End my suffering. We've heard the most powerful, the most life-changing, the most stirring things said about the ancient Greek stories we perform, these ancient war stories, by individuals who have lived lives of mythological proportions, who have faced the stakes of life and death, who have loved, who have lost, who know the meaning of sacrifice. It's our contention that these are their stories and that we have more to learn from them than to teach them. And that led us to hospitals and hospitals led to the military and the military led to prison and prison led to addiction. We have 22 projects that have all grown out of this central idea that the audience knows more than we do, that the audience is the translator. You would rather die than hear what I'm about to say. A divine madness poisoned his mind, tainting his name during the night. Our home is a slaughterhouse, littered with cow carcasses and goats gushing thick blood, throat slit, horn to horn by his hand, evil omens of things to come. I identify with the character of Ajax because I feel like even, even the people around him knew that he was a strong man, the strongest. And yet, even his own wife said, what are these weak words? coming out of this strong warrior because there was no recognition of what was going on. One of the things that I really identified with with Tech Masso when she talked about how Ajax was her homeland and her life. <laughs> I left my home. I left my school. I left my friends. I left my job. And 13 years later, I've never been able to go back to that. <laughs> because unfortunately, he is one of the ones that's been left behind. Um, we've been lucky to get very good clinical care. It's um, almost just enough went wrong that he did get excellent clinical care. But 13 years later, the resources aren't there for... <laughs> we've learned to give people, save people's lives, but we don't have the resources to give them their lives back. Now drive the unbreakable stake straight through his rib cage into the cliff. <laughs> Prometheus, I groan with you as if your pain were mine. Be careful who you groan for, or you may end up groaning yourself. How can you witness his pain and not avert your eyes? It's easy to watch him get what he deserves. Do not forget to lock the bar around his waist. Yes, I know. The person who was hammering down yeah, Prometheus, yeah. Um, that's like a, a, a correction officer starting off new in the job. Like, not wanting to do that, but having to do that one, and then six months later, they completely lost their humanity. But I love the play because it, the way he was so stubborn and feeling like, yo, I was right, I was right, I was right, no matter how you look at it, I feel the same way sometimes. Even though it was written so long ago, it still touches base today of how violence can affect those individuals. What is your only child's name? Pentheus. And whose head do you hold in your hands? A lion's head. At least that's what the Bacchant said. Look closely. Uh, 
I see the greatest grief. The woman that held the head, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. right, Agawe, that was so symbolic of like, what have I done waking up in the morning? You know, I woke up and there's blood, um, proverbial blood on my hands. This play was interesting because it showed how divisive the addiction can be. I guess when I think about what Sophocles was up to, I think he was up to finding some format so that we can all talk about this because in talking about this, we heal. And we hear each other's stories and we can feel them and cry with them and empathize with them. And I think that's what he was doing. I speak to those who understand. It's just, um, it's just remarkable. And I hope that you will take this in and not just, you know, watching those brief excerpts, but as you read, um, Shannon French's chapter on uh, the Iliad and what it has to tell us about the warrior code as expressed in Homer. Take the time to follow the story this time, you know, as well as the argument that, that Shannon French makes. Ordinarily, I would say focus on the argument, you know, let the illustrations and, and vignettes and so forth be of secondary importance. But in this instance, it's very important to understand the story of the Iliad. So make sure that, you're, that, that you take the time to follow uh, the story. And from a practical standpoint, if you want to know, you know how you'll be evaluated on that, I can tell you quite clearly. I will put the, the, the key events uh, in Achilles' story, the Iliad, and I'll put them in different orders get four different uh, possible orders uh, in which uh, that drama unfolds, that tragedy unfolds. And then you'll, you know, you'll pick the correct one. And if you've read that story, you will pick, pick the correct one. And if you've read that story and let it into you, taken it in as so many people have done for thousands of years, it'll be second nature to answer that question correctly. But this, this course, you need to try and think of it as beyond a grade and beyond one more stepping stone to getting your diploma. As important as that is, It's not the purpose of this course. This is a liberal arts course. And the liberal arts are not really about getting a particular job or getting and spending. The liberal arts are about learning what it means to be a human being. And Homer's Iliad, tells us much about that in the plays of Aeschylus and Sophocles, like, like Ajax, which you just saw, can tell us a great deal uh, as well. And from the standpoint of military history, can take us deep into the abyss that is war. 